So hello, uh, my name is Tom Prince. I'm the director of the Keck Institute for Space Studies. Uh, we're the sponsoring organization here. Uh, first of all, uh, this I think going to be a very exciting lecture today. Uh, I think we should all though, applaud that this is the official end of the pandemic for the Keck Institute lectures. This is the first in-person one. So let's... Uh, I'm here to welcome you, but I'm not here to introduce the speaker. I'm here to introduce the person who will introduce the speaker. Okay, and uh, let me give you a little bit of background about that because our lecture series are a little bit different uh, than some other lecture series in that uh, we have a group of Caltech graduate students, postdocs, and now alumni uh, who uh, are what are called Keck Institute affiliates, okay? And they're the ones that are going to introduce the speaker and be the, your host for this evening. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about the affiliates. So first of all, uh, the affiliates, uh, what we do, the way they're selected is they're nominated by faculty members uh, here on the Caltech campus. And there are about six to eight every year. So since 2018, I counted up, there have been 42 affiliates. So it's a rather gr big group. So any affiliates, can you raise your hands who are here? Okay, raise them high so people can see you. So, so quite a few. Uh, they have the privilege uh, of going to dinner with the speaker uh, after the lecture. And so the affiliates program, it's, it's about uh, having uh, students, postdocs, and alumni at Caltech uh, get to know prominent people uh, in the area of space exploration. So for instance, uh, they meet uh, aerospace, heads of aerospace companies, they meet astronauts, uh, they meet prominent scientists and engineers, and every so often they get together with the uh, director of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, so um, uh, basically, uh, I'm going to introduce now one of the newest uh, Keck Institute, uh, or KISS, what they're called KISS affiliates, and that's Chris Milner. Uh, he's a postdoc from uh, uh, GPS, uh, Geophysics and Planetary Science here, and his expertise, I read it in your CV, is uh, uh, fault rupture mechanics, uh, but he also not only does fault rupture mechanics, but he also uh, uh, studies and, and actually informs and advises on the hazards from fault rupture, uh, the geohazards and the risks of, of them uh, for a society. So uh, uh, a big hand for Chris, and he's going to be your host for the rest of the evening. Thanks, Tom. Um, so, yeah, welcome everyone today to the KISS seminar. Um, we're really excited to have uh, Dr. Bruce uh, Brenner with us tonight. He's going to talk about uh, the um, InSight's mission, its science goals, and what it's uncovered about Mars and its deep interior. So, Bruce Banner is, joins us from JPL, where he's the PI for InSight, working as a planetary geophysicist. He holds a bachelor's in physics uh, and a PhD in geophysics from the Univers University of Southern California. Uh, and has been working in the Earth and Space Sciences Division at JPL since 1977. His research focuses on the geological history of the planet Mars uh, and geophysical investigations of the interiors of terrestrial planets by using analysis of gravity, magnetic, topographic, and seismic data. Uh, Dr. Bannert served as the project scientist for the Spirit and Opportunity rovers for six years before handing up the proposal for the InSight mission, where he has been the PI for InSight since 2011. So prior to this, his, um, his scientific career, Bruce's inspiration space first came uh, from an early age, where his fascination started out with the Freedom, Freedom 7 mission, uh, which took Alan Shepard on its first uh, suborbital US space mission. Uh, his inspiration in planetary science then came from the 1975 Viking mission, where he thought, quote, the whole idea of actually landing on another planet was incredibly exciting to someone raised on science fiction. So I think we can all agree that um, Bruce has definitely helped succeed in turning some of that science fiction into reality. Uh, and um, I look forward to hearing more about that. So with that, uh, please help me welcoming Bruce up to the stage. Yeah, thank you. I, I hope uh, 
me get this turned on. I hope everybody agrees that this is science and not science fiction by the time you get to the end of this talk, but um, that's not for me to judge. So um, thank you for hosting me to, to talk about insight. This is probably this, my second most favorite subject after my kids. Uh, we can talk about them afterwards if you like. So um, I actually spent about 30 years uh, both um, sort of laying the groundwork, trying to sell a mission to do seismology on Mars, and InSight is the sort of the culmination of that, and uh, um, had a, a lot of uh, time before that didn't really work very well. So it's sort of a prologue. Uh, in 1975, uh, Viking was the Viking mission was launched to Mars, and the Viking landers each had a seismometer. And um, as a, a geophysics grad student, I was just you know really thrilled to be. Uh, waiting for the, the seismic data to come down from Mars and start doing some of the, uh, the, the work on Mars that, that we've, we've been doing on, on the Earth. And it was a, a, a huge disappointment to me, not as big as it was to Don Anderson, but it was a huge disappointment when that didn't really work. And so um, Viking threw a long shadow on planetary seismology, and it was really uh, about 35 years uh, between the, when, when the, the Vikings shut down in uh, roughly uh, 1980 and Insight was, was finally selected in uh, 2012 was the final selection. But there was, a, there was stuff going on in between. There was a, a lot of failed attempts to go to Mars with, with seismometers. Um, these are, are various different missions, uh, proposals, studies, and so forth uh, over the years trying to get seismometers on Mars to, to uh, peer into the deep interior and, and understand the, the inside of Mars. Um, so what was the, 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 the difference between um, all these different proposals and, and studies and, and insight? And perhaps it was the uh, uh, KISS uh, Innovative Approaches to Planetary Seismology workshop, which occurred in about 2010. Um, this was a, a workshop that, that uh, Dave Stevenson uh, conceived and, and, and headed up. And it brought together uh, a bunch of planetary seismologists, uh, terrestrial seismologists, and, and other interested parties, both uh, from the scientific side and the, the, the technical side, to really just take seismology and deconstruct it and try to understand you know, what we can use, put it back together again in ways that are appropriate for the various different planetary uh, targets. Uh, we talked about um, you know, uh, doing seismology on, on Venus, on Mars, on the, uh, the gas giants, uh, on various uh, airless bodies and so forth. And in each case, there's, there are, are different challenges and different approaches than what you would do with, with uh, uh, terrestrial seismology. And so I think this really helps kind of crystallize our concept of doing seismology with a single station on a planet and actually not just getting some idea of, of how seismically active it is, but actually doing the, 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 the real work of seismology for delineating the interior structure. And I think that really helped us to, um, to write a proposal that was clear and, and emphatic in its uh, 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 picture of what we would do with a seismometer on Mars and how we would get, get, the, get the job done. And so I, I really uh, have to, to, to thank the, 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 the KISS Institute for that workshop, which I think was, was really um, you know, kind of a, a critical piece of our proposal effort and of our uh, scientific uh, endeavor on Mars. Okay, so. Um, what was the InSight mission goal? It's, it's really uh, sort of the overall goal was to, to understand terrestrial planets in general, uh, using Mars as kind of a, a laboratory for um, planetary uh, uh, formation and, and evolution. Um, there's a, a bunch of reasons why Mars is a better place to do that than the Earth, uh, not the least of which is that it's, it's, it's easy to find uh, crust that's more than a few hundred million years old, which is not so much the case on the Earth. And so we went to, went to Mars, and we're going to do this with uh, three different methods, really. Uh, seismology is, is the main thing. Seismology is really, uh, it should be in, in a font that's about you know, five times bigger than the other, other ones, because that's really our, our, our main goal. We also use precision tracking, which uh, tells us about the, the rotational dynamics of the planet, which is really useful for understanding things about the core in particular. And we had a heat flow probe, which sadly did not work. If you know anything about InSight, you know that that didn't work. Um, I'm not going to talk about, any more, about that anymore because it's just too painful. Okay, so um, why is it important to understand planetary interiors? Well, it turns out that the interior planet is really 
it's, it's a heat in, engine that, that drives all endogenic processes. And endogenic, I mean, you know, processes that are within the planet. I mean, the only thing that really goes on on, on a planet that doesn't have to do with the interior is weather, you know, atmospheric stuff. And, you know, geologists aren't really too interested in that except for the, the, the fact that it kind of tends to tear things down. But interior processes really shape the uh, surface of the planet that, that, that we see today. And, and that's true for the Earth. It's even more true for, for the other planets uh, which have less atmosphere or hydrosphere to uh, kind of mess things up. Um, it, it is a source and sink of energy. It's a source and sink of material, rocks, uh, gases, volatiles, and it provides the, 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 a lot of the necessary uh, sort of building blocks for life to uh, uh, be able to uh, inhabit a planet. So um, the other thing that, that the interior does is it retains sort of the fingerprints of how, it was, how the planet was put together. And, and that's really where, where insight uh, kind of got, got its main impetus, is that we believe that Mars, and for, for a, a lot of different reasons, we believe that Mars uh, has not been modified very much since the first few tens of millions of years of, of its formation. There's, there's things that have gone on. Some of the stuff's gotten scrambled up. But it has a lot of the characteristics that were put into place in the first uh, 20 to 50 million years of, of, of its uh, formation. So uh, it's, it's, in that sense, it's a really good place to go and look at what happens when planets, planet, planets come together. OK, so, uh, so InSight's kind of a time machine, right? It, it's, it's designed to go back four and a half billion years, right to the very beginning of the, uh, the formation of the planets, and help us understand the processes that put the planets together. So uh, by looking at the, uh, so the results of the, the, the differentiation history of the planet, going from uh, a, a mass of sort of carbonaceous chondrites to uh, a, a, a thing that's melted and separated with a, a, an iron core and a, and a less dense crust and a, and a mantle with stratified, uh, all that got set up in the first, first you know, few tens of millions of years. And uh, so that's why we go to Mars to, to, to do that. And InSight sort of uh, tumbles back into time uh, to, in order to do that. Uh, but in another sense, it's a little bit less of a, of a, of a long time machine, and more of a short-term time machine. It goes back about 100, 120 years or so, back to the, the dawn of the 20th century, when we were asking exactly these same questions about the Earth. Okay, so at the end of the, uh, the 1800s, um, we had some idea that there was a core probably in the Earth because the, 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 the mass didn't really add up. Um, we didn't really know much, much more about it, and we certainly didn't know anything about seism seismology except that it knocked buildings down. And so the, the study of seismology was really sort of what we would call, you know, uh, 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 um, large displacement uh, 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 mechanics and, 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 and why things fall down when the Earth shakes. And so these are the questions that, that, that scientists were asking around the turn of, of, of the 20th century. So I'm going to sort of walk through, like, you know, well, what was happening on the Earth? So back in, in uh, 1889 was sort of the birth of seismology as a science that we, that we know it today, when the, the first detection, remote detection, of an earthquake was made. So this was a, a record that was, was obtained in Potsdam, Germany, from a, an earthquake that occurred in Tokyo. And it was only realized that that's what it was months after the fact when this, a steamer you know, steamed over and, and, and brought the news of this, this, this uh, earthquake which had destroyed much of Tokyo. And uh, uh, this guy, Ernst von Reuber Poschwitz, was, was actually looking at the uh, disturbance of gravity by the, the, the moon going overhead. And so he had a, a very sensitive accelerometer and he had this, this thing that happened in the middle of it which he couldn't figure out until he put two and two together and uh, started off the the um, uh, field of, of seismology, um, his, his uh, facial hair fashion didn't catch on quite as much as the, the seismology, but that's, that's just too bad. Um, so uh, within about 15 years or so, the seismology had actually advanced uh, uh, to a, a fair degree, and so uh, uh, Richard Oldham had been able to uh, determine the size of the core using seismic data. So it's basically, you know, uh, seismic waves going down, bouncing, and coming back up again. You look at that from lots of different stations, lots of different paths, and you can actually derive the size of the core from, from these kinds of measurements. And so um, by 1906, we actually had, for the first time, a measurement of the size of, of, of the Earth's core. 
Um, shortly after that, uh, Andrea Morovicic uh, was able to do sort of the same thing by looking at the uh, bounces off the bottom of the Earth's crust. And so he uh, determined that there was a, a, a layer, uh, a, a discontinuity, if you would, uh, at a depth of about 50 kilometers beneath Croatia between the crustal rocks, the ones that, that we you know, walk around on and can pick up and throw at each other, and some kind of material in the mantle, which is a, a different, has different elastic properties, different density, and provides a, a, a boundary of which uh, seismic waves can, can bounce off of. And so we, we now call this the Moho in, in, in his honor. Um, and this was, uh, uh, now we know the, the, uh, this, the, the size of the core, we know the depth of the uh, crust mantle boundary. Um, about uh, 25 years later, we actually get the uh, determination of the inner core by Inga Lehmann, uh, looking at uh, waves that not only bounced off the core, but waves that traveled through the core and uh, uh, were either uh, reflected or refracted through the solid inner core of the planet. Um, this was um, actually not well, uh, well believed within the scientific community for another, oh, probably almost 20 years until it was, uh, uh, the, the, her results were, um, were replicated by male geophysicists, go figure. But, uh, but she definitely had uh, the, the, the data to determine the, the inner core of the Earth. By the 1940s, uh, Gutenberg and Richter here, here at Caltech were uh, putting together sort of the, the picture of seismicity, the, the, the distribution of seismicity around the Earth. Uh, they're starting to see these, these uh, uh, belts of, of earthquakes uh, around the Pacific. Um, and, and uh, looking at things that are both deep and shallow and starting to see that, that earthquakes didn't occur randomly over the planet. They were actually grouped in specific areas. Uh, and of course, this became one of the bases for, uh, for uh, the, the uh, emergence of plate tectonics uh, uh, a few decades later. Um, within a, a, another few years, they, they had actually put together the distribution of, of seismic activity, uh, not with location, but with size. So the, 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 the the so-called Gutenberg-Richter cr uh, curve, which looks at the sort of size versus number of quakes, that, that uh, the, the, the larger a quake is, the fewer of them there are, and there's a, 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 a logarithmic slope to that, which uh, shows that uh, uh, you just get more and more quakes with uh, smaller and smaller magnitudes. Um, and so uh, within about 60 years, um, scientists have gone from uh, the, the, the very first remote detection of a quake to a basic understanding of the Earth and the way uh, seismicity uh, operates within the Earth. And um, InSight proposed to do that in two years on Mars, which is, uh, takes a lot of chutzpah, I think. But um, I'm here to, to report that we did fulfill that promise within, within the two years, which was our primary mission. Uh, and then we had another you know, two good years, which really uh, continue to extend our knowledge. And so uh, that's what I'm going to talk about today. OK. So here is the, the impetus for the, the InSight mission. So this is uh, a figure from um, the Encyclopedia of the Solar System. I, I, I wrote the chapter on planetary interiors. And this is a figure I put in there. And to me, the most important thing about this figure are these question marks. OK. So all these parameters, um, the size of the core, the thickness of the crust, uh, the, the, the presence of these um, phase changes within the mantle, which we, we know about in the Earth, they are all basically inferred and guessed at with you know, lots of good reasons uh, from what we knew about the Earth and to a lesser extent what we, we knew about the Moon. And so um, we really didn't know what the interior of Mars was like. We can draw pictures. That's something that we can do. We can make educated guesses. Um, that's what uh, a PhD gives you the license to do, is make educated guesses. Um, but we didn't have data, or we had indirect data, or we had you know, data that was on something else, but we could apply to that. So, so these were really nice numbers, but they were basically just made up. Okay? So what we want to do with InSight is actually go to Mars and measure these things and actually take away these, these uh, question marks and uh, um, literally rewrite the textbook. Okay, so here's Insight, Insight Lander. Um, we had the three main experiments. Remember, I told you there's a seismometer. This, that's uh, this guy here. We had um, 
these uh, radio antennas which uh, uh, talked back and forth with the uh, deep space network on, on, on Earth and made measurements of the, um, basically of the wobbling of the planet itself since the, the lander is attached to the planet at an accuracy of 10 centimeters. Okay, you can do this with accuracy of 10 centimeters at 60 million kilometers. It sounds like magic, but it's actually science. Um, and you have to take their word for it because the, the mathematics is, is, is uh, completely intractable. Um, we also had a heat flow probe. Again, I'm not gonna talk about that because I'll cry. I'm, I don't like to cry in public. Okay, so we had a lot of other instruments on this, this lander, it turns out. We, we sold it to NASA as having only three instruments. Uh, they like that because it's nice and simple. What can go wrong? But we actually put a whole bunch of other things on this lander. Uh, all in support of the seismometer because seismometers turn out to be very sensitive to other things. In fact, the seismometer is actually sensitive to, to almost everything more than it's sensitive to, to ground motion. It's sensitive to, to wind, it's sensitive to the magnetic field, it's sensitive to pressure, it's sensitive to temperature. Everything affects the seismometer and so you really have to work really hard to be able to make these measurements, okay? Um, so we, we put on a, a weather station to monitor the weather so we could take that noise away. We put on a magnetometer to measure the magnetic field fluctuations to take that away. And we put on a deployment system so that we could take the seismometer off the deck of the, the, the lander where it, on a Viking, that's where it lives. It's up here on the deck. And so Viking was a very good, good wind sensor on the deck, but a very poor uh, seismic sensor. So we picked it up, put it on the ground. We put a cover over it. And uh, we also had a camera on there to take pictures. Okay, here's our seismometer. I want to talk for a few minutes about this seismometer because um, I spent about five years of my life trying to make this thing work properly, and it finally did. So as I said, a seismometer is very, very sensitive, and I'll tell you how sensitive it is in a minute. So the way you, you, you make measurements is you have to isolate it from the rest of the environment. You want to couple it to the ground and isolate it from everything else. So we did that by putting different layers on it. So this is our, our, our windshield, which is something to keep the wind off of it. It has a, a bellows on it that sort of uh, conforms itself to the ground. Um, inside there we have a basically a thermos bottle. Um, on Mars you don't actually have to fill it with vacuum because CO2 is a, is, is a really good insulator at those uh, pressures. Um, inside the thermos bottle we have a vacuum sphere. No, it's not quite a sphere, but we called it a sphere anyway. Um, that keeps the uh, seismometer in vacuum so it doesn't have uh, any uh, contact with atmospheric pressure. It's also another uh, thermal insulator. Uh, on Mars, the, the, the temperature goes up by uh, anywhere from 70 to 100 degrees uh, centigrade between day and night. And you can imagine that the thermal uh, uh, expansion coefficient is such that that would swamp out most of what you want to look at. So inside there, are our sensors, so you take this all away, and these are the, the sensors that are actually measuring the, the ground motion on Mars. This is our so-called VBB, which stands for a very broadband sensor. Um, it's about the size of my fist, and it is exquisitely sensitive. It is a, an amazing uh, piece, of, piece of hardware to measure uh, ground motion on Mars. So um, this is a plot of the noise on the seismometer, and, and, and this is in, um, uh, acceleration, basically acceleration per uh, the square root of, it's, it's uh, normalized by the square root of, of the frequency, and this is frequency along the bottom on a logarithmic scale. And you, you don't have to understand this, but these curves here are the noise on the Earth. So um, these gray lines are sort of low noise, high noise, and medium noise at a place called a Black Forest Observatory, which is a seismometer which is deep inside a mine in Germany, and it's one of the two or three quietest seismic installations on the Earth. And this yellow curve is the theoretical lowest noise that you could ever possibly get anywhere on the Earth, okay? This uh, black line is a theoretical uh, noise of the seismometer. And the green cloud here is our actual statistical measurement of the noise on Mars. Um, the 
incredible thing is it's, a, it's about a thousand times quieter on Mars than it is anywhere on the Earth. You can't go anywhere on the Earth and get away from ocean noise. If you go in the, in, in, to Denver, you can pick up the ocean noise. You go in the middle of the Siberian plateau, you pick up ocean noise. Anywhere on the Earth, you're gonna see ocean noise. Uh, that's what this, these peaks are. And on Mars, it's a, a thousand times quieter, even with, with, with the atmosphere. Now, what is it we're actually trying to measure? Okay, so this is the sensitivity, if you, if you actually figure out what this is, this is the sort of the sensitivity of the seismometer. It's roughly the diameter of a hydrogen atom. So, so this is a, an instrument that's sitting on the dirt, on a planet, 60 million kilometers away, um, with the, the temperature going up and down by, uh, what, 180 degrees Fahrenheit every day, and we're able to measure uh, motions of the ground at the level of the, rate, the not the radius. I used to think it was the radius, but did the calculation. It turns out it's the diameter, so what's a factor of two? But anyway, that's, what, that's the kind of sensitivity that you need on a seismometer. And, and the, the seismometer in, in, the, in, the, in the basement of, of the seismolab measures it at, at this. This is not you know, out, of, out, of the, out of the ordinary for uh, terrestrial uh, lab-grade seismometers, but a field seismometer, this is, this is kind of amazing. Okay, so let's just kind of walk through the whole uh, 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 exploration of the planet. Our first detection of, of a distant quake on Earth, that's in 1889. We got that on, on 2019. Uh, this, that's the INSIGHT, MQS stands for Mars Quake Service, and that's a, a, a group of uh, seismologists. It's based at ETH in, in, uh, in Zurich, but has people on, working on the team from uh, a bunch of the other uh, places uh, that, that are uh, participating in the InSight mission from uh, Bristol, from uh, Paris, uh, from the US. And so these are the people who every day, the, when the data came down, they would go through uh, the, the day of data, find any, any Mars quake. So the first uh, Mars quake was, was uh, detected in March of 2019. Now that was about three months after we put the seismometer down on the ground. And so for three months, it was dead quiet on Mars. Actually, it wasn't dead quiet. It was actually very noisy. We thought it was quiet. It was actually noisy. It turns out that there's a noisy season on Mars due to the, to the weather and a not noisy season. And we'd landed in the middle of noisy season. And so uh, for three months, I'd wake up every morning, pull up my computer before I even got out of bed, and, and, and look what the, the report was from the, the, the Mars Quake Service in Zurich because you know, they're you know, nine hours ahead of me. Um, and there's nothing, day after day after day. And I just talked NASA into spending the better part of a billion dollars promising them that there would be Mars quakes aplenty. So I was starting to get a little bit nervous. Pretty confident still, but a little bit nervous. But then finally we got this. It's a, it's a relatively close quake, about uh, 450 kilometers away, and pretty small, magnitude 2.2. You probably wouldn't notice it if, if it happened in... Uh, uh, in your neighborhood, unless you were uh, lying down, but um, it was a quake, and you know we we were pretty confident it was a quake. So so this is what it looks like on on a, on a time series. This is actually how seismolo seismologists look at it. You know this is time going this way, and this is uh, 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 frequency on, on this axis, and then the color tells you the intensity. And so this is how, how seismologists actually look at at uh, at earthquakes. Okay. Um, Within another uh, month or so, we got a, actually a really nice quake. And so you can see down here, it's got a P wave here. It's got an S wave. When you got the P and the S wave, you can get a distance. We actually have uh, ways that we can actually get the direction from polarization and things like that. And we're able to figure out where this was on Mars, which is a place uh, called uh, Cerberus Fosse. Okay, here's the InSight uh, lander here in the western Elysium Planitia. This turns out to be the place on Mars where we expected actually to find Mars quakes. And so this is one of those few times in science when you make a prediction and it actually comes true without having to go back and refine your prediction and go back and forth. But so this is the, the, the place with the, the youngest faulting on Mars. It's uh, something like in the last uh, 10 million years or so. And the youngest volcanic activity, which is also in the last couple of million years. And so this has the youngest activity on Mars. It turns out to be that's the place where we saw our first Mars quake and we saw a lot more there. Okay, next we go on to crustal thickness uh, to get the, the so-called MOHO. Um, uh, that we were able to do also with uh, something we call the receiver function method, which takes into account the fact that 
when seismic waves go through these different boundaries, um, they're bent, they're reflected, uh, they can bounce up and down, and they're actually converted from P waves to S waves and, and, and back and forth. And so by using these relationships, you can actually get the thickness of these layers without having to know where that quake came from. And so that's very useful because these quakes are very difficult to locate. That's the one thing that multiple seismometers do for you really well. Uh, we have to really struggle to get locations of these, these, these Mars quakes. And so by doing that, we're, we were able to, to figure out what the crustal dense uh, thickness was right below the inside lander because we we're using rays that are coming straight up from, from below or almost straight up from below. And we got a thickness of about 40 kilometers and we're able to see that there are major layers within the crust. Oops, am I pushing something here? Oops, here we go. Major layers within the crust, uh, one at about 10 kilometers and one at about 20 kilometers. Um, and we can use uh, gravity data from orbiting spacecraft to actually extrapolate that all over Mars because we know the, the variation in crustal thickness from looking at the variation in gravity. Uh, and so we can find that the average crustal thickness of Mars is about 55 kilometers, and that goes into models of the initial differentiation of the planet, basically how much scum has floated to the top of the planet and how much of the, that, that has been uh, separated out of the mantle. And so that's a, a, a critical pr uh, uh, parameter in models of planetary formation. That's kind of, this is, this is actually the number that I wanted to know what it was back in 1977 when Viking went, and that's sort of what sent me down this whole path to where I got to today, is wondering what this number is. So, so I think 55, I'll just have 55 etched on my tombstone. That's, that, that says it all. Okay. Um, with that density, it turns out that, or that, that, that thickness, it turns out that density um, has to be less than about 3,100 grams per cubic meter, and there's a whole you know, analysis that gets you there. Um, that's a lot less than unfractured surface rocks, which are up at are 3,300 or more, up to even 3,500. And so that tells you something about how fractured the upper crust is on, on Mars, how much, uh, how, many, uh, how much crack openings there are going down to significant depths. And it can go down deeper on Mars because the gravity is less, doesn't take, have as much uh, uh, closing the cracks. Okay. Um, we were able to actually even do better than that uh, by using something called surface waves. And it took us a long time to get a, a, a Mars quake with surface waves. These are waves that are uh, excited by the larger uh, 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 earthquakes or Mars quakes. Um, and it turned out, oddly enough, that the, uh, the, the half dozen largest quakes that we saw for the whole mission all occurred in, in the last year and a half of the mission. So we had two and a half years of medium to largest quakes and then there just was a, a lot more of the larger ones for the second half of the mission. We don't really understand the statistics of that yet, but with those quakes, we actually started getting these surface waves, and they tell you things about the surface, uh, about the crustal thickness, all along the path between the quake and the lander. So not just that one point under the lander, which is what we got before, but an average of the properties of the crust over this, this distance here, over this distance here, and actually there's a surface wave that goes around the planet comes back the other way and comes up here. And so now we have something that's a little bit more of the, the average crustal uh, thickness. And it agreed really well with our first uh, measurement, except that one of those internal layers did not show up in this data. So we believe that that layer is probably um, peculiar to the, the region around InSight. OK, and finally the core. This is kind of the, the last number. I, th I told you that um, that crustal thickness number was the one that, that started me down this path. But this is actually a more interesting number when you really get down to it, the size of the core. Because since we know the mass of the planet, we know the um, densities of, of, of rocks in the mantle, um, the size of the core and the density of the core are are coupled, okay? The larger the core is, the less dense it has to be because uh, uh, a mass is conser conserved. So we were able to get the size of the core, again, by watching these waves bounce off the core from the, the Mars quakes to our seismometer here at the lander. And we were able to measure the core radius to be about 1,830 kilometers. Now that is, turns out to be really big, okay? We thought that the core was somewhere between about Oh, 1,600 and maybe 800, 1,850, you know, there, 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 was, there was a bound. We are right up at the top of that bound. This is a very large core, much larger than we expected. 
um, which means the density is really small, okay? So the density with uh, this radius is about 6,000 uh, kilometers per cubic meter, or six, six grams per cc, uh, depending on when you went to school. Pure iron nickel uh, is about 6,500. And so how do you get a, a density that's less than iron nickel? Well, you um, mix in lighter elements. So you mix in things like um, sulfur, carbon, oxygen. And when you mix those things in, it makes the density uh, less. You know, it's, it's just, it just dissolves them in there and it makes the density less. But that changes all the properties of the material. Okay, so now the, the melting temperature is changed. If it's a pure iron nickel core, the, the core of Mars would be solid today. There's just not enough heat in the, in, in the planet to keep the temperature at a high enough value to uh, melt, the, the, melt the core of Mars. But when you uh, dissolve uh, sulfur and carbon into the core at these levels, it changes the melting temperature. It pulls the melting temperature down uh, just the way you know, putting salt on an icy sidewalk, which you guys do in Pasadena all the time, it, it, it melts, melts the ice. This keeps the core molten. And so this actually allowed the core to stay molten throughout Mars's history. It allowed the uh, magnetic field uh, to be uh, uh, active uh, well into, into Mars's history, which has implications for the atmosphere of Mars, because the magnetic field shields the atmosphere from erosion from the solar wind and has really strong implications for the possibility of habitability of, of some kind of life forms early in, in Mars's history. So again, this is a, a really strong connection between what's going on in the interior and what seems like kind of a detail of the deep interior, which has really important implications for what goes on on the surface. Okay. Uh, inner core. So we don't think there's an inner core. It doesn't make sense geochemically. Um, we actually have a, a paper that's uh, in review right now. We, we have it back. I think we just put in our revisions uh, last week uh, of an uh, observation of ways that actually travel through the core and then back up to InSight. And so if, if, uh, if that's confirmed, then the uh, travel time of, of, of these ways compared to things going through the mantle tells us some, some gives us direct information about the material in the core. We, we can uh, not just infer it from the, the density, we can actually measure it from the, the, the seismic properties as, as it goes through. And so this is a, a really difficult um, uh, measurement to make. We did not promise that we would do that in our, our proposal. We, we hoped it, but we didn't promise it. And, and so if this is confirmed, um, it should give us some, some pretty strong constraints on the amount of stuff that, that's dissolved in the core. Um, there's also papers that are in review right now, which are calling into question whether this actually is the radius of the core, what we've measured is the radius of the core, or whether there's actually a, a, a molten layer of silicate, of, of rock, that actually is at the base of the mantle above the core, and the core might actually be significantly smaller, maybe down at that 1,700 kilometer level, but what we're bouncing our, 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 our uh, seismic waves off of then would be this molten layer here, because it's the it's the, the boundary between solid and liquid which pr produces this uh, really strong reflector. And so it may be that the core actually has less stuff in it, less of the light elements in it than we think, and we have this very interesting layer at the, bottom, uh, at the base of the mantle. Um, like I said, that's being peer-reviewed right now. I'm not supposed to, to tell you anything about it, but that's, it should be coming out pretty soon, so I, I'm not too worried about it. Um, or it might just be our imagination and the reviewers will tell us so. Okay. Which always, always is a, a possibility in, in, in science. Um, geographical distribution of seism seismicity. Okay, again, uh, this was 1941, where uh, it's, we have it, but it's ongoing. Of course, every time we got a, a news Mars quake, it, it changes the picture. As of December, we're not getting any more Mars quakes. Uh, Insights, Insight uh, finished its job last December. So we're now trying to, to understand what we have. And, and these are the Mars quakes that we've been able to locate. There's about uh, of order 25 to 35, depending on, on how much you were, are, are willing to, to, to trust the, the analysis. Um, and each of these loops is the uncertainty region of, of, of the location. So the, 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 the Mars quake probably occurred somewhere near the middle of all these little loops here, okay? And you can see there's a big concentration right in here and this is, 
that Cerberus FOSSE region. And a FOS, FOSSE means you know, linear feature in, in uh, uh, Latin or something like that. So these are some faults. They're, they're not re really even visible on this scale, but we have about 90% of our seismic activity, both in terms of numbers and in terms of, of uh, sort of energy release, happening in this one little region, which we fortunately landed not too far away from. I think this is about uh, uh, 1,200, 1,800 kilometers, I can't remember the exact, but this is, is, is of, of or a thousand, a little bit more than a thousand kilometers away, which is really nice because if it was over here somewhere, we'd have a hard time seeing it because most of these quakes are relatively small. In fact, the biggest Mars quake that we've seen uh, over the entire mission was about uh, magnitude 4.7 with a or bound of about plus or minus 0.3 or so. So it might be magnitude five, might be magnitude four and a half. And uh, that's not a very big quake. I mean, you guys have all uh, uh, sat through bigger quakes than that. Um, but that's the biggest thing that we've seen on, on Mars. It's just not as active a planet as the Earth, which is one of the reasons why you need such a, a sensitive seismometer. So this is telling us something about how Mars is losing its heat because heat is energy and energy is what drives uh, tectonics, which is what drives uh, uh, the, the fracturing of the Martian crust. And so um, it seems to be at this point in time concentrated in, in, in one spot uh, with a, 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 a bunch, of, bunch of outliers. And so um, we're still you know, looking at that. We're trying to, to ingest that and, and figure out what that tells us about Mars. And then finally, the uh, distribution of, of uh, uh, seismic size with, with number. Um, we have, a, a, this is the uh, line for the Earth. Uh, Mars is roughly a thousand times smaller than that. So the seismic activity of the Earth is about a thousand times less than it is on Mars. Um, if you look at places on the Earth that are far away from plate boundaries, which is where most of the seismic activity happens, um, it's close to Mars. Uh, that this, this blue line here is the seismic activity uh, in the eastern United States. And Mars uh, sits between these lines. Uh, this green line and the red line were sort of the, 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 the limits that we predicted uh, when we, when we, before we went to Mars. And the, the, the mean line isn't here. You can see that it's not really linear. Um, this was a, 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 a early um, analysis. We haven't really done it since with the entire data set. At that point, we had a, a dearth of larger quakes, um, so, so it, it dips here. Since then, uh, we pushed that up a little bit, so it's closer to uh, a, a, a logarithmic uh, line with uh, a, a, an exponent of, of around one. Um, so that is consistent with, the, with, with uh, the, the moon, it's consistent with the Earth, and so we think that that's a, a, a property of seismic uh, activity in general, it'll be interesting as we go to other planets whether that uh, uh, continues to be the case. Okay, and so finally we've got the, we've got the crust, we've got the core, uh, and then we have this whole mantle in between, which is a little bit more difficult to look at because it's not as, there's, the, the contrasts just aren't as big. You know, when you're going from the crust to the mantle, you're going from one kind of rock to a very different kind of rock. When you're going from the mantle to the core, it's even a bigger contrast. You're going from you know, solid rock to, to molten uh, iron. Um, in, the, in the mantle, there are some very subtle features. Uh, there are density increases. There are places where the atoms rearrange themselves uh, in, into a, a different phase. And um, we really didn't think that we'd be able to do that, honestly, with, with a single seismometer. But we have been able to at least uh, start on that. Uh, we've been able to, to look at sort of the uh, 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 stratification of the mantle, look at the variation of velocity with depth, which can be tied to both the temperature and composition. Um, this is a, 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 a demonstration of the detection of a phase transition that we expected on Mars. We actually expected it to be uh, uh, about uh, 100 kilometers away from where it actually was, but that's, this is what the data is telling us. That's a great thing about data, is that it actually tells you what things are, not what you think they are. So. We're doing a lot of different studies and we're, we're actually getting really good constraints both on the, the thermal structure and the um, uh, compositional structure of the Martian mantle from this single seismometer uh, sitting on the surface of Mars. Okay, so now we've, we've kind of gone through that whole uh, sequence of, uh, of, of discovery that, that Earth 
seismologists did uh, uh, in, the, in, in the, the, the last century. But now we get to something which really hasn't been done on the Earth, and that is looking at seismic events from, from cratering, from impacts, you know, uh, meteorites that come down, strike the planet, blow up a bunch of stuff, and, and cause shaking, just like uh, faults cause shaking. So um, the, the first time we did this, we, we found four impact events uh, from the seismic data. And this, this was really kind of interesting because we had these uh, seismic records that looked really weird. They had something we call chirps in them. Um, after the, the main seismic events, there was these things where the, 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 there, was, there was a big arrival which started out with, with low frequency and it, it frequently increased uh, with time. And, and that's these kind of curvy kind of things sticking up in this record. Um, and one of the people on our team said he thought that it was due to infrasound, basically sound, which was caused by the, the sonic boom of these meteorites going through the atmosphere, going down, hitting the ground, shaking the ground, and causing seismic waves that were then picked up by the seismometer. Sounded a little bit crazy to me, to be honest, but we said, we said well, you, let's, let's go see what happens. Uh, since there were multiple of these uh, uh, arrivals, we thought that there was a, an airburst here, an airburst there, uh, and then, then the impact, we could actually figure out what direction it was coming from, how far away it was, and so we told um, the people on the uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, why don't you go take a picture of this place, see what happened. And sure enough, they took a picture of this place and they said, oh, there's a fresh crater there. Um, we have a, a picture from a year ago and there wasn't a crater there. So we have all these, these pairs. This little dot here was after, this here, no dot. Here's after, no dot before, and same here, after, no dot before. So these were actually craters that were found with the seismometer and then checked by imaging from orbit, which is uh, about as good as you can get in terms of, of, of prediction. This has never been done on the Earth, okay? Um, there are only a couple, I think, uh, 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 instances where any seismic uh, uh, measurements were made for any kind of impact, and usually they're just from, from, from things in the atmosphere. And so this is a whole new kind of uh, uh, way of, of studying uh, these kind of, of impacts using seismic uh, measurements, which tell you about the sort of the dynamics of the explosion, basically, that, that when it hits the ground, how that crater is formed uh, during, during uh, uh, that, that uh, few tens of seconds of time, um, which we really don't have, have, have never had a, a, a handle on, um, together with uh, the, the morphology at the surface, which tells us about you know, what happened at the surface. And so this is really an exciting new new um, research area. Um, so those are all small impacts. Those craters were maybe a few meters to 10 or 15 meters across. Um, it turns out we actually have seen some larger craters. Uh, last week we, we saw two large, what we thought were quakes. Independently, uh, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter was taking pictures of they, they, they found craters. They do this on, on a routine basis. They've, they found several hundred new craters on, on Mars. And they found this one that was really big. And they realized it was so big that it would show up in their, their sort of global weather camera, which takes a picture every single day. And so they were looking through that. And here it was on Christmas. And here it was the day before, oh, no, sorry, this one. This one was on Christmas. The day before Christmas, nothing. So they had 24 hours in which this crater actually formed. They knew that it happened sometime between Christmas Eve and Christmas morning, right? So... They went back and they said, did you have any Mars quakes during that time? And it turns out we did. We had a big one. It's like 3.7 or 3.8, which is one of our largest, largest quakes. They said, and, and, and they said, well, where was it? And you know, we'd, we'd actually gotten a location for it, and it was right here. Okay, so there's, a, there's air bars on it, but it was right where you know, we'd predicted our Mars quake to happen. And so this crater is... 150 meters across, so it's, it's, it's the, the size of a, of, a, of a football stadium, about the size of the Rose Bowl, maybe a little bit smaller, um, which is a, a pretty big crater, especially if you're standing close to it. Um, and when we saw this, we said, well, let's go look back through our data and, and, and see, you know, look at some of these other quakes that we had, a couple of some of the other big ones, and we found, uh, sure enough, within a, a month or two, we found another one, another one of our larger quakes, and, and uh, 
and uh, that, 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 that's this one. So we're um, sort of, like I said, opening up a whole new uh, uh, research area of uh, seismic investigation of impact uh, dynamics. Okay, so back to the back to the uh, the figure. So here's what we had before. So now with insight, after insight, watch it, watch it closely. It's gone. Watch that. Ooh, the core grew from there to there. We uh, one of the uh, this phase transition just disappeared altogether. It got swallowed up by the core. Okay, it's no longer there. This one moved up a little bit. So these are you know corresponding to these phase transitions. Uh, we now know that it's a fluid core. We know what the, the, uh, the radius is. We know that the crust is basaltic in about 50 kilometers. So all those question marks are gone. So, so that's basically mission accomplished for insight. Okay. When, when, when I proposed insight, you know, we had what we called our level one requirements. And there's basically th 10 things that we said we could do. To a, a large extent, there are 10 numbers, right? Crustal thickness, core size, core density, layering. So I proposed to NASA, you give me a billion dollars, I'll give you 10 numbers. I gave them nine, okay, to be fair. I didn't give them 10. That's still $100 million per number. That's, that's, that's pretty expensive, right? But they're really, really cool numbers. Okay. So, um, so I've been talking almost all about seismology, right? Because that was really the, the basis of our mission, but we've done so much more with, with insight. So insight's accomplishments, pioneering, mapping the internal structure, that's really you know, the big deal. But there's all this other stuff we've done. Um, this is the first seismometer on the surface of Mars. Viking had a seismometer really near the surface of Mars, but not quite on the surface of Mars. Important distinction. First Mars quake, first measurement of an impact event, Lowest seismic noise level ever on Mars. You know, all these things, first infrasound measurements on Mars. We've been able to do infrasounds with our pressure sensor, magnetic measurements, first magnetometer near the surface of Mars, pretty close. Um, nutation, that's the, basically the wobble of the Martian North Pole. Never been, been measured on any other planet besides the Earth. And that gives us actually an independent measurement of the size of the core, which agrees with the seismic measurement, which is really nice. It's good to have things that, that agree. Um, our weather station is actually one of the best um, uh, collections of weather data ever done, done for Mars. Um, we're measuring the pressure uh, 10 times a second for a full Martian year, measuring the wind once a second for a full Martian year. There's, there's nothing else that can touch that um, in, in the 50 years of, of, of Mars exploration. Um, dust devils, we've measured 20,000 dust devils with our pressure sensor. There's a little pressure drop when dust devil goes by. We haven't been able to see a single one with our, with our camera. Uh, Perseverance sees dozens and dozens of them. We've never seen a single one. Uh, we think that has something to do with the amount of dust in our area, uh, but we can measure them very well with our, with our pressure sensor. We measure them really well with our seismometer. Like I said, seismometer measures these things actually better than the pressure sensor. And by using those two things, we can actually look at the stiffness and the mechanical properties of the upper half meter to several meters of the, of the soil. So, so Insight's done a lots of stuff that I, that I haven't had a chance to, to talk about today. It's been an amazing mission. Okay, thank you. Last time, first,